Uh, well, it's Halloween time, so you know what that means. It's it's. What does that mean? It means we talk about horror all month. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. Horror. Well, okay. I mean, we are talking about a particular horror author today. So it was kind of a it was kind of a story how this got together because I was I was thinking about doing a I was thinking about doing a proper video of me just kind of talking about my thoughts on H.P. Lovecraft, which I, I may still do in the future. But I decided to put it up to vote. I'm like, okay, would you guys rather see me have a conversation about it, or do you want me to just do a video? Let me tell you, it was pretty dramatic. Like, it was going back and forth. Like, there was some saying, really? go, go do it by yourself, and then it kind of creeped up. On the and then it tied and then it kind of people were starting to lean towards do the conversation and then I checked last it was tied so I was like, all right last <laughs> time it was conversation so I'll just go with that so yeah okay. talking but yes anyway welcome back to well I'm always tempted to say Britain's hangout hour when I have these conversations but um I am here today with my recurring partner in crime. Jason Furman, as we talk about the ever contentious but also beloved at the same time author Howard Phillips Lovecraft, the uh, the Providence, Rhode Island author of weird horror fiction, he's probably one of the most influential horror writers of all time. He has influenced very many people, such as Stephen King, uh, Neil Gaiman, China Mieville, um, Caitlin Kiernan. Uh, let's see, Mike Mignola, uh, Guillermo del Toro, um, many others, many, many others, uh, Victor Laval, uh, many others, many others I could name, uh, aside from maybe, uh, aside from Edgar Allan Poe or Stephen King, he's probably the most influential horror writer, uh, who has ever lived, so... And I, I thought this conversation would be interesting because, you know, like I said, there are many ways I thought about doing this. Uh, either me doing a uh, kind of epic poo type of thing where I just torch Lovecraft for, you know, for the lulls. Um, but I felt that wouldn't have been really fair. I, I thought maybe why don't I get a big fan of Lovecraft and me, someone who appreciates Lovecraft, but I wouldn't call myself a, a fan of his work. Um, kind of talk about his legacy, his writing, his ideas, all that fun stuff. Now, I should do a disclaimer, and, and Jason, don't cringe just yet. Um, for people who are going to ask, hey, Britain, are you going to talk about the R word today? Not really. No, we're not going to talk about that today. We're, uh, it's probably going to be brought up because, you know, it's a given. But I'm trying not to uh, talk about that too much because, to be honest with you, I am a little bit irritated with the, uh, oh, hello, kitty cat. Speaking of Lovecraft, he was a big fan of cats. But I, I digress. Um, more interested in talking about the themes, his impact on horror, my, what I think he does well, what I think he doesn't do very well, and um, just his impact on speculative fiction in general anyway i've been yapping for about three minutes uh jason speak yes speak <laughs> where do we begin so i guess i'll give a little history of uh my also, lovecraft journey i don't mean to interrupt you real but, quick i'll, I'll let i'll let yeah, you talk i promise it. but did i do well all right did i i did you cringe a little yeah it was a great great introduction i believe all right you didn't cringe at all at my racism no, comment no okay Good. No, I mean, well, you'll you'll see in the video, I guess, if you didn't see me on camera. <laughs> anyway, okay, now you can go. Uh, you can go. <laughs> yeah, Lovecraft. So um, I discovered Lovecraft when I was about 12, 12 years old, I think. Um, so I played a video game, a PC game called uh, Alone in the Dark, which has been remade twice now, I think. The original, still the best, of course. Um, and it came with this little um, weird newspaper, and it was talking about how it, this, this game was inspired by the works of H.P. Lovecraft. I was like, who the heck is this guy? So I go down to my local Walden Books. Uh, many of you probably don't even know what that is, but it was a, a book chain many, many years ago. And I picked up, um, I still actually have the copy behind me, the actual copy that I, the first collection I picked up of his. 
And I don't know, man. It just it just opened up the world of fiction for me. I'd never read anything quite like it, and I've been a massive fan ever since. Yeah, I mean, that's it's kind of interesting because, you know, you're very much... Uh, it, it's kind of interesting that you like Lovecraft so much because, um, you know... <laughs> He's, you know, I, I, I tease you about this, but you know, I understand. Yeah. You know, I, I, I get that there are some authors and books that that stick with you when you're a kid, and you still have a fondness for it even after all these years. I mean, <sighs> man, what did I read growing up? I mean, I, I read, you know, I read, uh, I read Oliver Twist growing up. Now, do I think everything in that story has aged well? Probably not, but I still love it. So there you go. Or H.G. Wells is the Time Machine for instance you know i read a lot of weird stuff when i was a kid it's it's, it's hard to know <clears throat> like um how much of it's nostalgia for me versus actual like uh this is good this is great however i well, have you seem to have a you seem to have a vested interest in in his yeah. ideas rather than just mere nostalgia because you've made a couple of videos um talking about oh this author got lovecraft wrong take that this book sucks, shitting yeah, I, all I, over it, and then there, and then you <laughs> made another video saying Lovecraft done right, right, Mr. John Langan, who I got to meet, I know, in Providence, Rhode That's Island, cool. which was awesome. Um, so yeah, which that 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 trip and that convention gave me a new appreciation for Lovecraft because I was around a lot of people who knew far 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 more about Lovecraft than I ever will, um, and so I got a. a primed for this chat let's say i guess but no <laughs> that, that I've worked actually out been, very well <laughs> yeah it worked out good timing wise i've actually been going back through all of his work chronologically mm. and i've gone through quite a few short, short stories to see his, his style evolve over time and i'll have to say that um i'm still granted there's some negative things about his work which i'm sure we'll get into in terms mm. of just prose and 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 just his styling i guess but um I'm still utterly fascinated uh, by his work. So mm -hmm. there you go. Fair enough. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess my relationship is, I mean, I, I actually discovered him when I was in high school. Like, early high school, I think, was when I first heard, like, H.P. Lovecraft. And I've always been a, you know, horror guy. I've Or, well, I don't know if I'd say, I don't know if I'd say it's my favorite genre in the world. But I do love horror a lot. I have an appreciation for it. You know, I'm a big Poe fan. I, I like Stephen King a lot. There's other authors as well that I enjoy in the horror. You don't read a lot of horror, though, I've noticed on your channel. Yeah, no, I, I'm really bad at keeping up with it. With, with, that's a lot of genres, to be honest with you. But, yeah, I, I'm really bad at... That's just... I'm, I'm really bad at keeping up with it. It's kind of like with science fiction. I'm really... I'm, I'm quite yeah. terrible at keeping mm -hmm. up with it at the moment. Um, though, in October... I like to read horror all month because, you know, it's Halloween time. It's one of my favorite times of the year. So, you know, why celebrate or why not celebrate? There you go. That's uh, what I'm doing, too. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I discovered Lovecraft, and um, I, I was I was very intrigued by um, the Cthulhu mythos. And I still am. I think it's a really... I think it's a really fascinating mythos. And his brand of horror was quite fascinating, too. Um, which I'm sure we'll get into as this conversation moves along. But um, I, I I've gone back and forth over the years. Like I, I I'll put it this way: I, I do make fun of Lovecraft a lot, and you know I do rag on him from time to time. Uh, sometimes that's me being facetious. Sometimes that's me, you know, genuinely critiquing him. Um. Uh, do I think he is one of the masters of horror? I don't know. I, I think his reputation precedes him. I think uh, I think there's authors who've done cosmic horror better than he has, which you know Ooh. you might you might quibble with that. There's a spicy yeah, take for I'd you. I'd like to hear about that. I'd like I'd like to hear about that. Um, but you know I and you know there's also the. It's kind of interesting. He has a very unique style, but he's also kind of ripping off other people, like you know Edgar Allan Poe. Um, that's every writer though. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of writers though. And, um, <clears throat> and it, I mean, if you've read his personal letters, Lovecraft acknowledged it. He's like, yeah, I love Poe. He's, he's a master. So I'm like, all right, we agree on that <laughs> about Poe anyway. Um, 
But uh, the idea that he tried to make this kind of, it's kind of interesting because, uh, like, he's not strictly a horror writer. That's kind of where he started. And he's kind of a dark fantasy writer as well as a horror writer. Um, at least, you know, with this, you know, old, you know, Cthulhu, the great old things and the mythos. And it's very much a like kind of a fantasy, except it's in our world, not quite a, you know secondary world though he, he did play with other things he did like the dreamland i mean hell the bust for the world fantasy award was a little 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 lovecraft well until people got offended and they got rid of it um uh what else what else i'll put it this way i really appreciate his impact and i appreciate what he did for the horror genre but um as a writer, I, I, I'm quite mixed on him. I think there's some really good stories he's got, like The Color Out of Space, for instance. I have a, I have a fondness for that story. There's a couple other ones I could mention, but they're not really popping in my head at the moment. Um, but yeah, he's... It's interesting talking about him, because you can't... He's kind of like the J.R.R. Tolkien of, of horror. Can't really okay. ignore him, even if you're kind of sick of his impact. Yeah. <laughs> I just think that he um, he's he he brought something unique to horror, right? That being mm. cosmic horror or expanding upon it, because there's plenty of I. It's funny. I mean, I think Poe's great, but I feel like Lovecraft contributed something greater than Poe because Poe's horror was very of the time, sort of what you'd expect, thick horror, whatever you want to call it. Whereas Lovecraft kind of he made his own thing. Mm. And uh, over time, and, and that's why I, I wanted to go back and read his stuff chronologically to see it develop over time. Now, granted, a lot of those developments happened through letters because at the con I was on a panel and one of the panelists said jokingly that he was a, um, a professional correspondent uh, part-time writer because he <laughs> wrote so many letters, so many letters. And he was in direct correspondence with, you know, the greats like Robert E. Howard. Mm -hmm. um who they 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 shared a lot of uh you know similarities but then also differences and i guess it was robert e howard who actually contacted him first and then they kind of developed a friendship after that because he robert e howard respected lovecraft's work and uh they were talking about how you can he uh, you can see his tone change over time like it's very formal in the beginning and then they become best friends basically not best friends but good friends and uh it was even said that they they believe that uh, Robert E. Howard's influence is shown in uh, The Shadow Over Innsmouth. Oh, yeah. Because that's really one of, <laughs> I think, maybe Lovecraft's only real story that is written like a traditional kind of narrative to a, de to a degree. Mm -hmm. um, most of his stuff is very, like, uh, epistolary or or just, um, it's, it's basically a big info dump most mm -hmm. of the time. So... Yeah, it's it's uh, I, I don't know. I, I think that I, I, I am going to go through a lot of his letters, his most famous letters, just to kind of see that develop as well, because I've, I've never been that interested until I went to this con. So I have noticed a, a, a progression of his work through reading chronologically, but it's not as apparent as I would have hoped, because you'll see like glimmers of the Cthulhu mythos in something like Dagon. Mm. Which is a great little story. I, I like that little story. To me, it encapsulates kind of the core of Lovecraft. Um, you know, somebody discovering something that is greater than them, and it's this uh, this this thing that drives them to madness. I mean, that's really more or less what comprises Lovecraft's work. And um, but then it kind of like goes silent for a bit when he writes more stories, and then it kind of rears its head again. So it's it's interesting to see. You, you think it would be almost like a linear line of progression in terms of like hey i came up with this little idea let me expand upon it expand upon it, expand upon it but it didn't really uh seem to be that way he kind of went back a little bit um to just straight horror a little bit you know mm -hmm. here and there so mm -hmm. but it's uh it's been interesting to um to uh to do that just to see it yeah you know it's, it's interesting you bring up the letters because that kind of brings up something i'm i'm quite fascinated in because I, I find might be another little spicy, little spicy here, but I think a lot of his nonfiction is really fascinating. 
Like, um, I don't know if you've ever read uh, his supernatural horror and literature. I have um, it right here. Um, well, okay, that's good. <laughs> but it's, uh, oh, look at that. It's, oh, that's an old copy, huh? Yeah, funny, uh, funny little anecdote. But um, I ordered this on Amazon.com when all they sold was books or were books. That was it. So, yeah, it's a weird old copy purchased, I believe it was like, man, I don't know, late 90s maybe? Maybe early 2000s? Yeah, it's it's interesting because he was very much a amateur scholar of the horror genre. And, I, you know, there's a friend of mine who once said this, and I, I, I'm afraid I must agree, but it's like, you know, man, if he had been a scholar and not a, a shut-in in Rhode Island, we might have gotten like a head start on horror literature scholarship before, you know, S.T. Joseph <laughs> showed up and basically single-handedly made horror into a somewhat respectable, like, you know, this is this should be uh, studied and appreciated, you know? Yeah. I, I could have said that better, but, you know, I, I didn't have the words at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I don't... Uh, okay, I'll ask you this. Like, what is it that you find so compelling about Lovecraft's work? Um, so, I think what it was is it was uh, this lurking, this kind of dread that is not like any kind of creature or or, or force that I that I was that I had encountered before. You know, it's not like ghosts or vampires or werewolves or anything like that. It was this other otherness, this very alien but monstrous thing. And I think that's what drew me to it originally. And it's just there's also something fascinating about many of his stories are these like um, historians, researchers, antiquarians, et cetera, et cetera, stumbling upon a book or maybe being related to somebody who got into some weird stuff and they do some genealogy and trace back there. So it's it's like... Kind of like I, Lovecraft himself. No, I'm kidding. Right. <laughs> well, well, that's a funny thing. That That's one thing I realized um, after this trip to Necronomicon. I read The Shunt House and I read um, The Case of Charles Dexter Ward on the plane back mm. because those are two of his only or very few stories actually based in Providence. Mm. So they take place in Providence, Rhode Island, and you didn't you didn't cover was, those in the in the recent video you did. <laughs> well, I didn't talk about the story specifically, but oh. I did like a whole like explanation of 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 to how those two were, and then you could walk the streets, you know, the streets, the name streets, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I walked down this um to this ancient graveyard where he mentioned Edgar Allan Poe went or walked uh um in uh, the shunned house, the story. And anyway, so what I'm getting at is the appreciation I gained from it <laughs> is that one thing, especially Charles Dexter Ward reads like a, like a, like a, like a nonfiction book. So it, it, it feels real. Um, mm. And I think that's part of the draw for me as well is there's this authenticity to it often where to, to kind of like ad nauseum in a way. So in in, Car in, in the case of Charles Dexter Ward, there it, it's about this guy who basically discovers he had an ancestor and he starts researching him and stuff like that. But the specificity around who beget, who beget, who beget, you know, lived in this place in this time period and hit historical events that were happening or happening around it, it feels so enmeshed in reality that it really draws you into the story itself. And I think that's a big part. It's it's something that I've I've just recently realized or come to appreciate more, because I, it was always hard for me to put my finger on like why is love why do I like Lovecraft so much? And not that I enjoy reading history books or anything, but <laughs> his style of writing, not in every story, but in many of his stories, approach a level of authenticity that feels historical. So it it. You know, normally, normally you're reading a book and you know you're separated from this, right, for the most part. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It doesn't feel like you can walk down these streets where, in particularly the shunned house and the case of Charles Dexter Ward, you literally can walk the streets. I did. And it's insane. There's you plenty know, you of can, other books that take the... place in real places. <laughs> no, I, no, I know. But, like, it's, 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 weir it's weirder for me when it's, like, horror. Mm. And... 
it's just it, it's creepier walking those streets at night and finding on page whatever and seeing like oh shit this is the graveyard he walked in it just has a different quality to it mm. um than a, a standard historical fantasy or historical fiction book because it's like historical stuff but then like with a layer of this cosmic horror weirdness on top and I don't know. It, it's it was weird walking around Providence, old Providence, because you feel like you're you feel like you're in a Lovecraft story. Like it's 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 bizarre. Even even well, now, they do call it Lovecraft's country for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, I think that's one thing to note, especially regarding his writing style. So his writing style can be very archaic, dry, um, however you want to um, purple at times. But to me, it really feels like somebody like a historian documenting something and, and giving it like um again this authenticity to it that, that really makes it come up to come to life at least for me yeah if i if i remember right um lovecraft had a deep passion for providence rhode island he had a yeah. deep loyalty to the place which is something i can identify with um and uh i mean even though a lot of his you know, stories are him angsting about the unknown, um, as China Mieville would put it. Uh, he was basically this big ball of angst. <laughs> um, um, he had a, he definitely has a reverence for where he comes from. Yeah. Yeah. He, um, I mean, the tragic thing about Lovecraft, just like Poe, never saw really any form of, uh, celebrity during his life. Um, he, you know, he published in Weird Tales and stuff like that, but mm. um, with the exception of the Shunned House, which is this edition I have right here, that was the first time that he attempted to actually put something into publication, like his own, like a print. He, he ran into this kid. He was like 16. He had access to a printing press. They chose the Shunned House at the time, not because it was his favorite story, but because it like fit the format. It's like about 50 ish pages long or so. And so they got together and they printed some copies that never got fully published, published, but um, that was his first kind of foray into like, hey, I, I really want to see my name on something that's not Weird Tales or some other pulp magazine. Mm. And so it's it's sad that both he and Poe like never they never got to see that. They mm -hmm. never I mean, imagine imagine um, I'd argue that Lovecraft is bigger than Poe now, um, and it'd be crazy it to be look debated. back and see. That, that's definitely a debated it be, topic. It can be debated, but if you think about just I don't know like how. Again, maybe it's it's difficult to 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 quantify uh, Poe's influence because it's it's more generic, whereas Lovecraft is very specific, right? You know, if you read a Lovecraftian story, um, generally there's going to be tentacles, there's going to be some kind of ancient dark force or something like that, right? Where when you when you read a story inspired by Poe, like what does that even mean? There's a raven in it, like what? I mean, it's gothic horror. I, I guess I don't know. How well, I mean, if you read a couple of those Lovecraft stories, they are very Poe-esque. So, yeah, I mean, well, he was a massive fan of Poe, like you mentioned. Um, I mean, I, it wasn't he wasn't as obsessed with rhyming as Poe was, but still, <laughs> very Poe-inspired. I'm, yeah, I'm, Poe I'm not a big poetry reader, admittedly, so you can take that with a grain of salt, uh, poetry yeah, fans. Yeah, not either. Um, have you read any of Lovecraft's po poetry? poetry? Yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I have. Um, oh, fun fact, though. Also, I didn't know this, but Lovecraft, even though everybody thinks he's a little angsty, antisocial guy, he was a big fan of Christmas. Oh, was and he? And I have a book <laughs> of all of his Christmas writings behind me. Well, it's it's somewhere over there that I picked up at the con, which I, I had no idea. So, I, I yeah, actually he didn't loved, know that. Yeah, and they're not, they're, not, um, they're not like, hey, kids, let's get around the fire. Tentacles come out and kill you. It's no. nothing like that. It's like... It's 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 Christmas stuff. So he it's had a him, very is he had it a him like geeking for, out about Christmas. Yeah, they're just stories and poems and things that are that are all. He just loved a cozy Christmas. That's so, fun. Um, that's another thing I learned about him visiting uh, Providence is that he wasn't as antisocial and introverted as a lot of people think he was. Like he was he was pretty well traveled for a man of that era. Like yeah, he, I think he, he went, went to like Quebec yeah. at one point. Yeah, he went all up and down the East Coast, Florida, all the way up to Quebec. Yeah, so he um, 
he was he wasn't just a, a shut in like a lot of people think and so it, it opened my eyes and I'm, I'm excited to read his 1600 page biography by st joshi at some uh, point yes, to get the, a... the <laughs> premier lovecraft expert who yeah, i yeah, both I really respect and also am really frustrated with a lot of the time but again <laughs> we'll get into that as i like to yeah. say when we talk <laughs> yeah and he um he lived in new york for a couple of years and then met a woman and mm -hmm. uh, fell in love. So, you know, he's not, um, um, I don't know. He wasn't the guy that I think I thought he was, as well as a lot of people paint him out to be. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, um, I, I, I mean I'll mean, i admit I have not read uh, I Am Providence. I have only read a lot of articles and watched a lot of conversations with S.T. Joshi because yeah. I, I have a I have a fascination with learning about authors and who they were as people and all that and I mean you can't really go wrong with Joshi he knows what he's talking about for the most part. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I mean he's kind of the Harold Bloom of of horror scholarship really if you think about it, or at least yeah. I think so. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I would agree. I do think people think of him as a shut-in. Eh, it, it's kind of mixed. I, I think at first he was kind of a shut-in because, like, you know, he he likes he liked Providence. He liked living there. And then he goes to New York, and he's like, oh, how spooky. And then he goes back to Providence, and then he starts traveling around later in his life, and he's like, oh, this, this isn't that bad. And then he right. dies, unfortunately, before... Um, yeah. Uh, before and on that note, I, um, I learned that the reason why he, well, I shouldn't say the reason why he died, but um, he was, I guess, known for not not going to the doctor when he felt pains and things. Oh, so yeah. So he would basically suffer and suffer and suffer until it was unsu insufferable, basically. And um, then, by then, the cancer was, you know, too far gone to really, I, I honestly don't even know what they would have been able to do back then anyway. But, yeah, it was it was a product of him just sucking it up and being like i'm not i'm not going I yeah he has to, he, if you get an idea from like his letters he has this like english gentleman kind of vibe like he, he did kind of stoic english gentleman which is kind yeah. of it's kind of interesting that he would later become pen pals with robert e howard who was the exact opposite he was this very rugged america Cowboy. manly man you know Mm -hmm. Or at least he fancied himself a manly man. He thought he was. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, um, but yeah, no, I, um, I, I, a little side quibble. Um, I was, but there's a show called Scooby Doo Mystery Incorporated that has an episode that kind of, it, it's an affectionate parody of H.P. Lovecraft. And um, he has this fanboy who's basically Robert E. Howard. And that kind of mm. bugged me because. I think Robert E. Howard had a very distinct view that was not Lovecraft's. I think you could have used someone like Donald Wandry or August Derelith as like a stand-in, but I know a lot of people probably won't know who that is. So I get it, but it still bugs me a little bit. Yeah, and you can, if, if anybody's watching uh, who's interested, there is a book that is a very fat book that contains all of the all of the accessible, I guess, letters between Lovecraft and Howard. In a single volume so if you want to check out their correspondence in full at least what was you know what was uh you know captured or, or you know available after his death like you can do that yes indeed um i it you know it's interesting i mean i think with poe i think poe was more interested in like insanity and like psychological like gothic horror and then Lovecraft was like, I'm going to take a little bit of that, and I'm going to take a little bit of this stuff from Lord Dunsany, who I haven't read, admittedly, but apparently was a big influence on Lovecraft, um, especially his uh, Dreamland stories, mm -hmm. which I, I, I think are quite fascinating, because it's kind of him basically doing his attempt at fantasy, and... Yeah. Um, I won't pretend that like they're great or anything, but I find them quite fascinating because they're just really out there and bizarre. The world building is is pretty pretty weird. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like a it's almost like a fantasy science fiction or science fantasy, whatever you want to say, setting. It's really odd. Mm-hmm. And he was very enthusiastic about this. 
Um, I, I think he stopped after a while, but it was kind of apparently that was kind of his tribute to Lord Dunsany. I, I haven't mm. again, I haven't read Lord Dunsany, so I can't really comment on that. But like Poe, I mean, you know, the gothic stuff, the atmosphere, that's definitely it, it's kind of interesting. I mean, I think he does borrow from people, but I mean, I have to say it, he does have his own unique voice. You know, I often talk a lot about singularity of voice, and that means, you know, when you read a story, you know, oh, this guy was the guy who read it, which is the sign of a great author, at least in my opinion. Yeah, um, I mean, if you read a Lovecraft story... I mean, Lo like, Lovecraft okay. has that. I don't. I, I mean, I don't yeah. know if I would call him a great author, per se, at least in my opinion, but he has that, believe it or not. Yep. Though some of those stories are kind of his Poe impersonation, but, you know, I won't... Everybody has those, though. I mean, that's yeah. a, that's the thing. Like, we're all a product of, of our inspirations, right? So we, we kind of pick and choose. Some of us copy uh, a little bit more closely than others, or if you want to call copy, or more inspired. Uh, and then others are, manage to um, take all of their inspirations, their, their very disparate inspirations, and put them together into their own voice. But, yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. And, you know, it's, I mean, you read a Lovecraft story, and you're like, what the hell is this? Like, Eldritch? <laughs> You know, cyclopean. Cyclopean. Yeah, he loves he that. Loves that word. There are certain there's certain words that he likes to charnel. fall back to. He loved charnel. He used charnel a lot. Charnel. Yeah. And you're yeah. like, what the hell is that? And it's kind of interesting because I read the um, there's the Del Rey Conan editions that they put oh. out a few years ago, which I often recommend people to read because that's Howard's stories unedited as he wrote them. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, sure, you might consider it a bit dense by today's standards but they're pretty accessible for the most part you know but i mean i know they were doing different things you know howard wrote fantasy adventure stories and lovecraft was doing his horror fantasy whatever the hell he was doing you mm -hmm. know over there in lovecraft land um i think there's one thing that should be noted between howard and lovecraft and another thing i learned at the con on a panel about lovecraft and howard is that uh, Lovecraft explained over and over and over again, he was in it for the art mm. and Howard was in it for selling stories. He's like, I want to make money. I want to do this for a living. So I will just crank out stories and stories upon stories. So, and he wasn't, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, of course, but they had very different outlooks on their fiction. One being, uh, now it's know, a fantastic writer, I think yeah, anyway. Mo money, money driven. And one being like, I'm doing this for the art of doing it. So um, it was cool to see two people on, you know, either side of the, the writing spectrum being, uh, I don't know, getting along so well. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, from what I've heard about that book you mentioned earlier, of their correspondence, apparently it's them just bickering about political and philosophical differences. So I don't know. I haven't read it, so I won't comment. <laughs> um I mean, it, I, you know, I, I won't contrast their styles too much because, again, I, I think they both have very different ways of looking at things. They have different styles, you know. They were um, both very R-word, but I know we weren't going to talk about that. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure we'll get to that. Um, but, I mean, Lovecraft's writing in general is, I mean, I have a couple of copies of some books I got. There's the Penguin edition, this Penguin edition of The Call of Cthulhu I bought a few years ago. Um, I haven't cracked it open because I've read a lot of these stories. So, they even have the color out of space in this copy, so, you know. It's a good story. Have you it, seen the movie? N no, and I kind of, I, I don't know if I want to. <laughs> it, I'm afraid what? they're... It's a is it it's good? It's a great movie. It yeah, is. I think it's. I think it's. I think it's probably the best Lovecraft film there is. Really? All right. All because right. actually, he actually treated it like I'm being. I seriously want to tell a Lovecraftian story. Most of Lovecraft stories that have made it to film are either they're 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 making light. They're making it lighthearted or cheesy, or they're making it tentacles. Like, it's so low budget. Yeah. Or it's so low budget, nobody cares. Um, Apparently, I mean, yeah. The one like Lovecraftian horror film that I really enjoy, I mean, it's my favorite horror film of all time, The Thing. 
Um, I forgot to mention John Carpenter. He's also very deeply inspired by uh, Lovecraft, especially um, mm. In the Mountains of Madness, which, subtle. It's about a... Anyway. Yeah. Um, apparently, Arctic. Prince of Darkness and uh, In the Mountains of Madness are his most Lovecraftian. I don't know. I haven't watched them. I, I want to, but I just haven't gotten around to it. I have watched The Thing, and I'm like, you know, if ever a Lovecraftian movie existed, this is it. You know, without, you know, just being an adaptation of a Lovecraft story. Yep. At least... I would say it's pretty Lovecraftian. Yeah. It's At least in, in my humble view. It's, it's a good cosmic horror movie. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's more about the horror than the cosmic nature of it, though, you know? Mm, mm-hmm. Um, I also have this... Um, I, I really like this copy, the, the Beyond oh. Arkham. Oh, yeah, the, yeah. Nice. I, I, I'll admit, I'm, I, I bought it... Uh, for the Victor Laval intro, because I, I like Victor <laughs> Laval a lot, but um, it's pretty good. I, I like the, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a nut for you know annotations and like history and stuff. So you know, it's a good book. I really want to get the one with the Alan Moore introduction as well, but you know, one day, one day. I know you got, I got it. That. I'm really, I got that baby up there. Yeah, you know, I, I, I it's, there's a local bookshop that has it, and I'm like, mm, should I pick it up? It's probably gonna be like ninety dollars. I really want to pick that up. But anyway, really, um, it's not available just like retail anymore. Oh no, it's um, there's a, it's a, oh god, what's it, it called? It can't be, it can't be ninety bucks. I feel like it's probably like what fifty at most. Maybe I don't know. I might pick it up. I don't know. Anyway, um, so again, it's it's not that like I dislike Lovecraft. I just, well, for one, I I just. Mm, that I, I again, I'm trying. I won't get too ahead of myself. I'm I'm, I'm trying to kind of. I'm not really. These aren't. These aren't really structured. But I'm trying to like you know keep us on a. I'm trying not to get too jumbled. Um, like I said, I, I appreciate his impact, but like the stories themselves, eh, you know, I just I'm not. Um, how much of his work have you read? Oh, I've read most of the famous ones. Like, so uh, like Mountains of Madness, Dunwich Horror, yeah, uh, Shadow Over Innsmouth, yeah, Paul Cthulhu. Okay, uh, I've read a lot of, I've read some of the, I've read the Dream Cycle, the um, Dream, what, god damn it, what's it dream called? Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath. That well, one. yeah, that one. No, I mean, just the, I think it's just called the Dream Cycle, actually. I've read a couple of those. I read some of his, um, like the Rats in the Walls, and okay, that's a good one. Um, uh, god damn it, The Outsider. Have you read The Outsider? Uh, is that the one about the well? Uh, spoilers for anyone who hasn't read it. Isn't that the <laughs> one where the guy like crawls out of the the building and he's like, "Hey, what's going on?" And it turns out like yeah. he's one of the like yeah. boogaloo yeah. creatures. Okay, yeah, I yeah, have read that. I, one. I, I I love that story. I feel like that's there's actually a film kind of loosely based on that by Stuart Gordon, but um, called Castle Freak. <laughs> but um, never heard of this. Yeah, yeah. I, I, like I said, I would, I, you know, as as a young kid, I was really into Lovecraft and sought out any kind of Lovecraft related film. Um, Herbert West Reanimator. Herbert I've West read that, Reanimator. which is a pretty unhinged his, little story. Which is his, uh, pr- which is his kind of Lovecraftian sort of unhinged take on a, uh, her on a uh, Frankenstein. Yep. Um, though, uh, J- uh, I'm hoping St. Joshi, um doesn't watch this he would rip me a new asshole and say i have no clue what i'm talking about and they won't remember me in 50 years so <laughs> um uh what else have i read so it sounds like you've read like the bigger the bigger one so yeah i, I mean i haven't read like well. i mean i haven't read like every single thing he's done i i've, I've tried it to like do like the case of charles dexter ward couldn't do okay, it you didn't re- couldn't do it. Yeah, that one is very uh, front loaded with a lot of that. I also tried to his, do it on audio, stuff. which is yeah, I, I probably should because I'm actually trying. I'm thinking of doing some more immersion reading next year, so we'll see how that mm. goes. But, yeah, um, if you if you end up uh, listening, there's a fantastic collection of all of. Well, I shouldn't say all of his works, but it's most of his works uh, by the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society. They're the ones in Providence who put on the con and stuff or involved with it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's on it's on Audible and it's 
really, really well narrated. It's two guys. They kind of alternate, and they're um, they're theater, they're thespians, and um, they just have a really great voice for like Lovecraftian stuff. So I highly recommend that one. Yeah, it's um, I, I might check that out. Thank you. I, I I've listened to. Have you ever heard a horror babble? Uh, no, I have not. Oh, I think you would enjoy him, actually. He does a lot of Lovecraft. He does a lot of very classic weird fiction. So, Robert E. Howard. He's done a couple Robert E. Howard. He's done some Ray Bradbury, Clark Ashton Smith. The podcast? What? The po- podcast or what? No, it's a YouTube channel. It's kind of like... Oh, um, okay. It's kind of like audiobooks. He's done like Ambrose Bierce oh. and um, the classic weird fiction writers, basically. Cool. Um, I'll, I'll send you a link after this is over. I think he would enjoy... I think he would dig it. Um, he's a, uh, but I, I've, I've listened to him do a couple of Lovecraft stories, like The Color Out of Space, and he, he's very good. Um, though I, it's, it's, well, I was gonna say, he sa- he, he looks a lot younger than he sounds, because, like, when I first heard him, I thought he was, like, 50 or something. He's, like, in his <laughs> 30s. So I'm like, all right, good voice, man. You, you tricked is he, me. Is he British, or? Yeah, he's British. Okay. So, you know, it, it kind of works, because, you know, there's this kind of, it's kind of hilarious. Lovecraft was American, but he was basically yeah. like a British person who was misplaced in America. I mean, if you think about it, there's plenty of people, I, I don't want to say just like that, but there's people who cling on to cultures they're not par- a part of. Oh, yeah, and sure. try to embody it, you know, like be a little phony. Um, but yeah, I mean, he just, he loved, he loved it. He loved that vibe and he lived it. Yeah, he was a he was a big Anglophile, as we would say nowadays. <laughs> um, and he used a lot of British like spelling and pronunciation, yep. like the color out of space, British pronunciation, not pronunciation, but you know what I mean, spelling. Mm-hmm. Why not? Yeah, I'm making it harder for myself, Jason. <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> it's been a long day. Um, well, what else? I mean, yeah. So. What I was getting at is, yes, I've read a lot of the popular stuff and some of his other stuff that isn't as well known. I, I still need to see the Reanimator film because I do like Jeffrey Combs, <laughs> but like everyone's like, "Oh my yeah. god, you haven't seen Reanimator?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I mean, it's no, it's good in a can, it's campy. Oh. That, that's a, that's my problem with most Lovecraft movies or adaptations is they're apparently the guy who made it is you know? big fan Lovecraft. Um, yeah, or it's, was it's all he, right. he sadly passed away some years ago. Yeah, it's been um, a long time since I've seen it, but I remember liking it. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it's it's, but I I I'm really fascinated. It's, it's kind of the anti Fight Club for me. Like, you know, where Fight Club, I'm just freaking tired of its impact on people and its popularity. But like with Lovecraft, I'm really fascinated by it because you know, um, because you know he has had this big impact, and you know I think. There are some other cosmic horror writers or, you know, writers in that vein like Ambrose Bierce and, you know, Algernon Blackwood and, um, I mean, there's some others I could probably name um, that I think need more love. And I'll give S.T. Joshi credit here. Um, he has really worked hard not only to keep Lovecraft's name alive, but also these other writers like Ambrose Bierce and... Um. Uh, God damn it, uh, Aldernon Blackwood, who uh, Lovecraft spoke very faint, uh, very favorably of. Um, his story. Um, it's not the Wendigo. Uh, it's his other one. Damn it. It's a real famous one. Can't think of the name at the moment. Uh, if anyone watches this, let us know what it's called in the comments. Um, it's like the Black something. Uh, let me let me look it up. Actually, I have my phone right here. Um, Algernon Blackwood. Though it's kind of funny. I read the Wendigo little little non sequitur here, but I read the Wendigo a few years years ago. Uh, did you grow up around the time that Scary Stories to Grow uh, to Tell in the Dark came out? Oh yeah. Because like I was a I was a fan of those books. This uh, is the very copy that oh, I Oh, that was the one read, I read. I, I read on on camping trips when I was a young lad. That shit so traumatized me actual, when I was a child. 
I love them. Yeah, they're great. The Willows. I knew it was the something. I I couldn't remember. It's the Willows. I know he spoke very favorably of that story, and it is a very good one. Um, though my non sequitur point, um, Blackwood's The Wendigo is the same story as in Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. So I'm listening to it, you know, horror babble. I'm listening to it years later when I'm going to college. And he literally says, my feet are on fire, my my burning feet of fire. And I'm like, holy shit, that's the story I read when I was a kid. What the <laughs> hell is this? Which I'll admit is a little goofy, but, you know, I, you know. Yeah. I, um, but yeah, no, it's, um, but back to the point I was making, I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by his popularity and, and why he struck a chord with so many people. Well, he, he did create a mythos, so that probably helped a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but mm-hmm. I, I, I've also noticed, I mean, I know you complain often about Lovecraftian-inspired fiction that you feel like it misses the point, and, and you get very passionate about this. Um, again, like you said, you made like two videos talking about um, Lovecraft done wrong and then Lovecraft done right, question mark. Well, I mean, they, they, were, <laughs> they, were, uh, they were book reviews, so, uh-huh. um, and it just happened to be that I read two books that I felt get that got one that got Lovecraft and one that, that did not because so many so many writers um, they they throw some tentacles in there they throw some spell books they throw some cult people and they're like this is Lovecraft it's like that's that's not what Lovecraft is and they they fail to capture the atmosphere the tone the themes all of that stuff and that's a lot of what I see uh, when I read Lovecraft inspired fiction it's it's not really it's 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 kind of carbon copy copy ish but like also not I don't know uh, a bit missing the point as people like to say yeah missing the point a little bit and it's it's unfortunate because I I would have hoped that if somebody were inspired enough to write a Lovecraftian story that they would have read more than like I don't know one story or something and, and, and read tentacles and thought, oh, I'm going to write something like this. Oh, oh, yeah, and The Call of Cthulhu. I have read The Call of Cthulhu. Oh, of course. I figured um, you had. Yeah, that's... <laughs> Just in case you didn't know already, I have read that. Um, But, yeah, no, it's it's. I'm kind of fascinated by his, his impact because, you know, there's, um, there's other horror authors I like a lot and I wish were more well-known. But, you know, uh, I, I find the authors who last, um, sometimes it's based on luck. Because, you know, um, Lovecraft died, like, right at the point where his work was starting to kind of go around. And people mm-hmm. were like, oh, this is actually pretty good. Like, you know? Um, yeah. 46 years old. Yeah, he wasn't old. That's how old I'm going to be pretty soon, so it's oh. kind of weird. <laughs> well, try not to get stomach cancer anytime soon. It's, I'll, t- I'll try not to. Don't don't eat any like cold raw beans like he would he was one to do. <laughs> cold raw beans. Um, or something. I don't know. I don't know how beans work. Don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> no, raw but, beans will kill you. Do not eat uncooked beans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we should put that as a disclaimer. Don't eat raw beans. It might kill mm-hmm. you. They killed Lovecraft. Not really. Just, <laughs> <laughs> not really. But um, it's uh, it yeah, it's it's interesting. Though I mean, I I guess if I could say some of my issues with him are more philosophical more than like anything else with his style. Mm, um, I've heard this. And and no, on. not the not the R word. It's just um, it's it's not the R word. Okay, so. Before people start pulling out the "it was the standards of his time" thing, it was it's not it's not the racism, I promise. But um, yeah, that's really where my issues come in. But I am quite fat. But my point I'm making is I'm quite fascinated by the 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 impact of his work and why it's touched so many people over the years. Even though if you read his work, his view is very bleak <laughs> and very like. Good lord, I need to take a, I need to like step out into the sun at the at, for a moment. Too bleak for you, too hopeless. 
Something like that, yeah. But um, yeah. I mean, I'll I'll explain a little more later. But yeah, I know it's. But yeah, that 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 was the point I was making. Is I'm I'm, I'm fascinated by by how popular he is. Um, you know, even though he was this kind of weird eccentric guy from New or not New York, Rhode Island, who you know wrote for a pulp magazine. Nothing against that. I mean, you know, I like Robert E. Howard, who, you know, was a pulp writer predominantly. I think mm-hmm. he was very good at that. Um, who is another writer I think gets disserviced a lot in favor of Lovecraft because a lot of people are like, oh, Lovecraft's good, but this Howard guy, yeah, he was a, he was a moron. And I'm like, you should read some of his horror stories or uh, some of his um, Conan stories are actually well written good stuff but i digress i'm i'm not ranting about howard today um but yeah no it's i i think is if you have any thoughts about the points i've been making <laughs> the points i've been throwing out like candy for a few minutes well I, well i wasn't sure what you were going if you were going to expand on that or not yeah i mean you keep saying you were you're fascinated by his impact and well i, yeah, mean, I mean that's I, I think that I mean that's kind of the you know you, you you could shoot holes into it you know but that's just kind of it. I'm also fascinated by a lot of his concepts I guess as well you know I'm, I'm I'm I really like the Cthulhu mythos like as a as a thing I'm quite fascinated by it like you know I like Cthulhu Nyar Lothotep you know the the gang the Shagoths Yog Sothoth Yog Sagoth yes. Which apparently, according to St. Joshi, it's actually pronounced uh, Clulu. So I'm like, I don't freaking know. I don't think Lovecraft was oh. really thinking that hard about it. To be honest with you. <laughs> or maybe he was. Or maybe he was. I have no idea. Or, yeah, well, he had I mean, nothing else to do. It's kind of odd. I don't think it was necessarily that he. I think he was just thinking like, what's a word that's just unpronounceable? Cthulhu. That'll work. Or Clulu. That's what he called it. Clulu. Yeah. Or Clulu. Because it's like, it's not meant to be spoken by human tongues. Ah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, but I, I'm like, I'm really fascinated by that. I'm really fascinated by his imagination. And there were times, you might be shocked, Jason. There were times that he could write in an evocative sentence. Wow. Mm-hmm. Look at that. Mm-hmm. What praise. Mm-hmm. What praise. Mm-hmm. Yes. So I, res- I definitely respect him. I'll put it that way. So it's not like, you know, I, I don't hate him. Is what I'm. Is what the point I'm making is. Because you know, I, I I tease you a lot about Lovecraft, and you know, I'm just I'm just screwing with you. It's not really. I mean, it's fifty fifty. We'll say that. <laughs> some of my genuine problems, and some no, just as, I'm gonna screw with Jason today. <laughs> well, I mean, as a massive Lovecraft fan, I'll, I'll be the first to admit that you know his characterization sucks. His prose is very. Uh, I mean, it's arcane it's perp it's it's arcane but it's purposeful like i said the way he writes adds to that ancient history kind of vibe of a guy like like a real guy who existed at one point talking about all of this genealogy and all these weird events that went on and being I, I, very specific with locations and year dates and you know it's if i were more brazen it, it i would say pretentious it. but it, that wouldn't be right because that's actually how he talked like if you read his it, it yeah, that's how I, he actually that's... talked. So it's not pretentious, <laughs> technically. Right. He 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 like embodied this whole thing. So when I was at the panel, when they were talking about his letters, they were saying that they were saying he wrote to his aunt. He's like, oh, this wretched, unnameable, eldritch house that I found on the corner of blah blah blah. <laughs> like like he's writing to his aunt in this way about eldritch. So I, I do love the word eldritch. If you didn't notice that already, <laughs> I do love that word now. So th- I, I do yeah, thank it's, Lovecraft it's a great for that. Word. It's a great word. It's a great word. It's like I don't know where he came up with, or well, I, I don't think I don't think he came up with it. A lot of it was just words he picked up from, I don't know, the dictionary maybe. Because a lot of it, he was self-educated for majority of his life. Mm-hmm. I think. Yeah, to my knowledge, I haven't I haven't dug deep into his uh, education, but I don't believe he went to formal university or anything like that. Yeah, no, I don't I don't think so either. Because, I mean, I, I do know a good bit about Lovecraft, but, like, I'm not, like, a... I'm not a... I'm not S.T. Joshi. I don't think anyone will be no, S.T. Joshi. Oh, no, 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 no. That guy's... 
That guy's serious. Oh my god, yeah, he would. He'd be like, "Who the hell's this punk kid talking about Lovecraft?" Um, I, I've actually emailed St. Joshi though. He, he's um, he's been nice to me. He did. Though. Yeah, yeah. He responded to you? Yeah, he did. We, we've exchanged a few emails. He was nice to me. Yeah, just, you know, go on his blog, find his email, shoot him one. He'll, he'll probably respond to you. Are these are these going to be published <clears throat> when you're famous? Your correspondence with... Uh, probably not. I would, hope, I would hope not. I mean, my well, God. Well, I have to ask, like, why did you email him? What were you trying... What, what did you ask him? Well, uh... Well, for one, just to see if I could, see if he would respond, for one thing. Um... Mm. And uh, another, I was kind of, I mean, I, I have gripes with, you know, some of the things he says, but um, his knowledge, I'm kind of, I'm kind of fascinated. He would be a good Britain's Hangout Hour guest, you know. I'd ask him about horror for a majority of it, probably. Um, and maybe, I mean, I know he's very passionate about Lovecraft. I have friends who, who know him pretty well. Um, one of my friends, I won't name him, but he, he, I remember him once saying he literally lights up like a kid when, when, <laughs> when Lovecraft's brought up. So I'm like, all right, you know, I, I don't think he's sick of talking about Lovecraft, but I would love to talk to him about some of his other scholarship, like, um, with Beers and Dunsany and, um, Arthur Mackin and, you know, some, some of the other scholarship he's done, uh, but, um, yeah, though, I mean, you know, I, I was going to save that for um, the end, so I won't, again, try not to get ahead of myself, but if anyone is interested in learning about Lovecraft, S.T. Joshi is probably your best bet. Dude knows what he's talking about. Again, I don't agree with some of his interpretations, but I, you know, if you want to know about Lovecraft, his work, what he thought about the world, how he lived, S.T. Joshi's probably the best place to best place to go he's also written about a litany of other subjects but lovecraft is one he's very particular about yeah very very epic biography <laughs> yes which i haven't got, i don't have and uh do i want to read it i don't know <laughs> maybe someday yeah i want to read it i mean i it, it, you can buy it. it it both it was published in two volumes now you can get it in one volume 1600 pages i got the ebook because there's no reason to have a 1600 page book so um, um what that. are some so what are some drawbacks for lovecraft for you i mean i, I can imagine drawbacks? some of them but like you know like, like some problems you have with some of his well work. i would say that sometimes when i read lovecraft i often have to read very very intentionally like i have to really slowly pay close attention slowly yeah, deliberately, just very, it's not like most books where, so a lot of times when you read a very well-written book, a very well, uh, a great prose stylist, you might say, you're kind of like the words vanish. You're just sort of sucked into the world and images are just popping into your head. Whereas Lovecraft style, you have to read it, at least I do anyway, very carefully because, and sometimes I have to go back and read the sentence again because I'm like, wait a minute. I drifted. I got to go back. So I'd say, like, for me, the drawback is his style because mm. it is so archaic um, for me. Well, I, I think generally of the time. But so I don't feel like it's um, it's as accessible as it could be in a lot mm. of ways. Mm. And sometimes you feel like you're trudging through this very dense prose to hopefully get to the good stuff. You know, like the, the spooky what's what's going to happen at the end kind of thing. Um, but that's, I'd say that's his biggest drawback for me is, uh, is the actual, like getting through the pros mm. can be, can be a, a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's fair. I mean, it, it's kind of interesting cause like, you know, a lot of people like to make fun of his pros cause you know, he's very, he liked big words a lot. As we mentioned yeah. before, you know, he liked words like, uh, Eldritch and psych. Uh, Cyclopedian, I think. He kind of reminds he kind of reminds me of um. I mean, they're very different in terms of style. But he kind of reminds me of Philip K. Dick in that way, like just a ver just not only an unusual way of looking at the world, but just like when you read their writings, you notice just a bunch of weird phrases and just turns of phrases. Mm -hmm. Um, um, I think S. T. Joshi kind of put it as a commitment to the weird heavily yeah, paraphrasing I mean, here 
that's that's why I'm kind of torn on it because on one hand, it's difficult, mm. but then at the same time, it's part of what makes it it. Like it it feels like you're cracking open this ancient tome and reading an account of some mysterious man who went mad, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's what it feels like. It feels genuine. It just feels authentic, and so I wouldn't change it. You know, uh, part of part of part of the the charm of it, I think, is that like. It's almost like he's asking you to like, don't skim this, like take in every damn word. Cause I labored over every damn word. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, if I could say some of my problems, I mean, not necessarily like, eh, I mean, sure. The prose is dense, but like, you know, I, I, I like, you know, Vladimir Nabokov and Cormac McCarthy. Like I, I can deal with that, but I mean, I'm not, a lot of, some of my issues just in terms of his storytelling like a lot of it there's the sense that like he's like more trying to be like ooh spooky and then he doesn't really do anything like at the mountains of madness one of my gripes with that is it's basically just a bunch of scientists walking around looking at like you know oh jeez just like ice statues of things from a long time ago and ah, like there's a lot of him describing it and not really showing it mm -hmm. you know and then when he does show it he goes like oh this weird unknowable thing ah, you know and it's just kind of it, it, it isn't really i don't hopefully this makes sense but you know it doesn't really come off as scary it just kind of comes off as okay this guy thinks it's scary but it's not really like connecting even though i understand what he's getting at i think there um i think it depends on the story because i read uh one recently called um god what was it the picture on the wall i think or the picture in the house something like that mm. and it's a very simple story about a guy who's he's riding a bike and i can't remember why he stops but he he goes into this house and there's nobody there and um he finds this book mm. and he starts flipping through it and he hears the sound coming from upstairs and this old man, you know, hobbles his way down the staircase and has a conversation with him about the book that he's holding in his hands. And he does build up this kind of suspense. And at the very end, it, it ends with this like kind of creepy, creepy vibe. I don't know. Um, maybe, it, I'll have really to, maybe, I'll have to, maybe I'll have to check that one. Yeah. Out. And, and it's not it's not. Lo it's not Cthulian or Lovecraftian mythos that story in particular, but it's it's a it's a nice simple story about this guy goes into a house, finds this creepy old man, he finds this weird book with a picture of weird shit going on, and they have a conversation about it, and it ends in like a I won't spoil it for you, but you know it, it, it sounds it, it worked for me it that, had that that vibe. sounds cool if you you know it sounds cool with you <laughs> describing that, but I've read a couple of Lovecraft stories <laughs> where it's basically him just over explaining things, and you're just like, "Oh my God, why? Oh, this guy's a master of horror, though I mean <laughs> there's some stories like uh you know the color out of space, which almost feels like a folk tale, you know, yeah, I'm like, ah, yes, I mean, I won't pretend that story's perfect, you know, it still has the you know drawbacks. You know, sometimes yeah. the overwrought prose, but yeah, I, I can see where you come from. There's oh. more like it's creepy, you know. I mean, I I do know it is like a crazy drunk guy telling him the story, but still, it's like you know, like it genuinely feels creepy. At least yeah. to me, it does. No, I hear you. Yeah, it's it's kind of. I, I think really you need to be in the headspace of Lovecraft. You need to be like, okay, I'm going to read Lovecraft right now. It's not like you casually pick it up and you're like expecting whatever and you just read it you'll probably be disappointed but i i totally i hear what you're saying and i wouldn't say like when i read a lovecraft story i get chills up my spine or anything like that but or, really uh, what the horror is it makes me think it makes me it, it's it's like the whole um it's the cosmic horror where it's uh we're insignificant there's mm. greater things than us out there that are ready to just crush us it's more of an existential horror than a uh Ooh, that gave me the chills, you know? Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, but eh. perhaps it's just me applying my 21st century lens of what makes a good horror story. But Right, and there's, that's, that's another thing. You can't do it's, that. That's, it's just yeah. kind of, you know, it's like I think at the Mountains of Madness is probably the biggest offender because, again, it's just people standing around, excuse me, 
people standing around and like looking at like statues, and you're like, what the? F- what are you talking about? Or, well, creatures, I know what he's though. talking Remember about, the, but it's just like this there. is scary. Like, come on, guys, no. But it did inspire Arctic horror, though. So I guess it's not all bad. We did get the thing out of it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Del Toro was going to make that into a film. He's tried to get it made for many, many years. But they've even done some screen tests and stuff, like actual like CGI um, tests to just kind of block in some shots. But alas, um, never got made. I think that's one of the most interesting things, too, about Lovecraft is how he's this cult phenomenon. But like he's never, I guess maybe The Color Out of Space is probably the truest feature film that's ever been made based on one of his works that actually feels like a real movie that had a real budget and real actors involved. Uh, whatever you think of Nick I was kind of nervous like. from, because I saw a couple trailers. I thought it was like, I'm like, oh man, Nick Cage. And look, I like Nick no, Cage. I, He's a great actor. But yeah. he does have a tendency of hamming it up from time to time. And it kind of looked it's, like Nicolas Cage is going to ham it up this movie. Uh, I mean, you know, Nick Cage is Nick Cage. I wouldn't say he goes too far over to where it, it ruins the experience, but also it's a modernization of it. So uh-huh. it's not like they, they went back to the 1900s and early 1900s and, and tried to make this a, a period piece, which I think, honestly, I would love to see that. I would love to see like an actual period piece Lovecraft adaptation, like something The Shadow Over Innsmouth, right? And get but Robert Eggers make to it, do it. There you go. Perfect. I would take hundred percent. And, and, and <laughs> which I, I guess he kind of did a little Lovecraftian with the lighthouse, but, um, I, yeah, I, yeah. That's a little Lovecraftian. I would, I would yeah. like, I would like to see like a, um, even black and white. I'll take it black and white. That'd be great. I, I would like to see a, um, a Lovecraftian adaptation. Robert Eggers. I would like to see him do it. I think he would do very I well wish. with it. But what's crazy is his stuff is all like, it's public domain, so it? it doesn't cost it doesn't cost anything to get the rights. Yeah, it's all public domain. So, um, to my knowledge, unless other people own certain properties, maybe like maybe there's been people who own like the Cthulhu stuff or whatever. But I'm pretty sure if you want to make a Lovecraft film, you just fucking do it. You, you don't have to get rights or anything like that. And so that is a that is I mean it's a small financial burden. I mean I did research once where like I, I guess authors now typically we'll get anywhere from three to four percent of whatever the budget is of the film as as uh, if it gets a- adapted so you save that much money anyway but I don't know I think um, I think it's possible there's been some decent like uh, there was a I think the technology has gotten better so you can get away with a lot more now well yeah of course I mean you could easily make uh, a well speaking of which James um, James Wan, I believe, is is uh, in the middle of a Call of Cthulhu sort of developmental hell oh, right now. Good luck with that. So he was, yeah, he was um, adapting it. I, I don't know anything more than that, but yeah, it got stuck in development hell. It, it's what I'm getting at is it's weird because, to my knowledge, anybody can make a film about any of his stories. But um, and he's got a pretty good cult following, but I guess it's not big enough to really be a financial like, you know, studios, they they don't want to take a big financial risk. Mm. So they're like, nobody's going to want to watch. Who knows what this is? You know, most people don't even know who Lovecraft was. So. Yeah, that's that's a fair point. That's a fair point. Um, um and and to be honest like how do you adapt lovecraft cuz again a lot of it is just kind of you know unless you have to kind of expound upon it a little bit yeah you'd have to do one of his longer works like at the mountains of madness call of cthulhu uh shadow over innsmouth um case of charles dexter ward you could make into a film but yeah you'd have to kind of cuz most of his stories are somebody telling you the story after it's happened or some third person who was involved or the person himself. Um, so you'd have to kind of, you know, make it more visual. Yeah. And I mean, he's, uh, he's a, um, he's an acquired taste as I imagine we've already kind of gone through in this. Yeah. 
Um, so I guess I'll ask you the opposite question. Um, mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I already kind of asked you what drew you to his work, but like, what is it about his work that's like powerful for you? It's uh, it's it's. I think it's what you don't like. It's it's the it's the hopelessness of it. It's the looking up to the stars, and re- you know, as, as people, we're often like looking at the ground or looking straight ahead at us, and we're looking at the world we live in. And then, you know, when you look up to the stars, so Lovecraft, when he presents these ideas about these people, like tapping into these these insane infinite vistas of, of ultimate horror, you know, you look up at the night sky and you, you, you see like, wow, and you start to think about, wow, every one of those stars is, a, is, a, is like a sun in, in some other faraway place. And you just feel so alone and so... Uh, insignificant right i think that's what he's trying to paint so that obviously obviously I, I, or i'm also drawn to like he just has this like um and a big part of it is when he wrote like he was writing contemporary stuff at the time he wasn't writing like a historical piece typically right they were usually yeah. around you know when he lived but it has that charm as well it has that old cobblestone street you know victorian style houses and just um stuff like that old creepy graveyards you know i guess it's more a poe aspect where it has mm. this gothic nature to it mm-hmm. so atmospherically i think i'm really drawn to it in that regard um i'm always like yeah it's 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 like it's like you're you're it's it's death by quicksand really right mm. you you crack open a lovecraft book and you're slowly sinking into it you know mm-hmm. it's slowly <laughs> death by a thousand cuts because you have to you have to like really wade uh, or trudge through his prose. Um, yeah, it's just, I don't know. It's something you just really sink into. That's at least that's the mindset. And it's kind of like a, a weird cozy feeling, even though it is not about cozy things. Fair enough. It, it's kind of funny. It reminds me of a conversation I had with my friend Raph and we were talking about, well, we were talking about Robert E. Howard and he was like, I, I think why so many people can't really replicate what Howard did is because on on some level, the the stories he wrote were written by someone who was not well as a person and had a very very unbalanced in a way. Um, it's really hard to replicate that specific you know unbalance. I, I think it's a similar thing with Lovecraft. Yeah, I mean, to everybody... his credit, there, there's this unique pain and neurosis that's in his work that you just can't replicate. Yeah, or it's like someone like Stephen King who was just high as fuck and basically... Or Philip K. Dick, for wrote, that matter. Who's, yeah, exactly. Is an mean, author yeah. I, I enjoy in that similar vein, though, you know. Yeah, some of the greatest writers uh, were... They did not live very long. They weren't very successful. They weren't very Even Edgar Allan Poe, well. for that matter. Yeah, exactly, <clears throat> exactly. So, yeah, there's there's a big, um, a big draw or, I think life experience often you know i talk about donald ray pollock all the time but it's like it's like john it's like john langan i haven't i've not met him but i've seen interviews with him he seems like a generally well-adjusted guy yeah from totally from all accounts funny funny as hell yeah you highly recommend you have a conversation with him if you're ever able to because he'll he'll make i I was friends with him on facebook i have thought about talking (laughs) to him but uh sadly we weren't like close and then my facebook account got hacked so fucking bastards uh, um uh anyway um but yeah you know like you see like John Langan or you know a Victor Laval they seem like generally well adjusted you know normal people as far mm-hmm. as i'm aware they could be like mm-hmm. weird sex fiends for all i know i don't know <laughs> but they don't have that Neil just Gaiman. yeah yeah you know <laughs> uh, they like they don't have that you know unique weirdness and like neurotic Lovecraftian nature, which again, I think is why it's really hard to replicate him. Mm -hmm. No, I I agree with that. Which, you know, I I think is why it's interesting when someone kind of takes that idea and kind of runs with it, you know, like a, like a Jeff Vandermeer for that instance, or a Neil Gaiman and Neil Gaiman has done it in some of his work. I mean, hell Lovecraft kind of started urban fantasy as we know it today. I mean, you know, you read something like the horror at Red Hook, which I think is one of his not very good stories for, you know, not just for obvious reasons. But anyway, not getting into that yet. Um, (laughs) 
Did you short circuit? What happened? Sorry, someone, someone's talking. Anyway, uh. um, what was I saying before I got interrupted? Uh, you were talking about um, how Lovecraft's difficult to capture, or any writer, I guess. Who yeah, had... I mean, sure. Yeah, you know, it's like you could say that about anybody, like Edgar Allan Poe, or you know, Cormac McCarthy, or you know, they have very specific views that just can't be replicated. Now, I'm Dude, not saying Foster that Wallace. No, I'm, I'm I'm not saying that um you know Cormac McCarthy was like a damaged or broken person or anything because like I've seen interviews with him and again seemed like a pretty well adjusted guy for the most part because you know we we have better mental health things today. Uh, other than him saying things like telling his wife, "Hey, go get a second job so I can just stay <laughs> on the right." Well, okay, yeah, that that that's that's fair, but oh yeah, like he's you know. I, I I do think you can capture a bit of that energy, but, like, add your own thing to it. Like, I think, you know, like, some really good writers have done that. Like, Neil Gaiman and uh, mm-hmm. China Mieville. And um, I've heard John Langan does it very well in The Fisherman. I haven't read it yet, but um, yep. apparently that's, Laird Barron the... does as well. I've, I've only read his crime novels. I haven't read any of his very lauded short story collections. Um, but I think you can riff from Lovecraft, but if you try to replicate him, forget it. You're probably not going to get very far. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, I, what they always say is like a lot of people who have lived a life, you know, create the best fiction, right? It's because they, they distill all of their experiences down into the stuff that can't be replicated because it's, it comes from human experience. So yeah, there, there is a lot to be said. Musicians, the same thing. Artists, mm-hmm. like any kind of creative endeavor, uh, often the tortured souls are the best ones. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, definitely there's... Um, Not always, but sure. it's, uh, yeah. it's an ingredient that works sometimes. Um, <laughs> I don't know if the telling the wife to get a second job is him being tortured. I think that's him just being a stubborn asshole. <laughs> yeah, not not McCarthy. Yeah, <laughs> he's probably like, "I'm gonna do this writing thing." So you're getting another fucking job. He's like, "Fuck you! I'm divorcing your sorry ass." You know, I won't get it. That's a also born in Providence, Rhode Island. Apparently, uh, McCarthy really? was. I didn't uh-huh. know that. Uh huh. There you go. Um, um, but yeah. Well, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I probably should get the thing out of the way. I, I said we were going to talk about it a little. I don't want to talk about it too much. Because you know what? I'll admit, Jason, I'm a bit tired of it. I'm a bit tired of, of the... Because I feel the discourse isn't very... Um, it's contentious, is a good word. Um, so, yeah, I'll just get it out of the way. Yes... H.P. Lovecraft was a racist. It's in his work. It's in his personal letters. Um, I I won't say I wouldn't hang out with him because, to be all honest, I don't. I never freaking knew the guy, so I don't know what the hell he would be like. He might be very charming personally, and from accounts from people who knew him, he was. And you know, he was he wasn't stupid. He understood people weren't um probably didn't feel the same way he did, but um. Yeah, I do think it should be talked about, for sure. I just don't like how it's talked about, because while I rag on S.T. Joshi a lot, because I I think he... um, I I think he lets his fondness of uh, Lovecraft uh, uh, overcloud his his judgment. Um, But he is right when he says that people who harp on his racism kind of miss the point of his work in general. Which is more about, you know, cosmic indifference and all that. Sorry, you were going to say something, though. Oh, it's just, it's not a very interesting discussion because, you know, we're looking back on a guy through a modern lens in a time period where the majority of Americans at the time were racist. Mm-hmm. Eugenics itself was a very widely held belief. So it's, 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 it's not interesting to me because you're basically saying, Man, that Lovecraft, he was like people around him in the time he lived. Like, what do you, like, what? I just don't understand the yeah, point. It's, it's like they're trying to judge him. Like, I understand, like, part lens. of it, it's like, 
look, there's people in that time who didn't like him, but I could just be like, too fucking bad. There were people back in the 1800s who didn't like, you know, who didn't like fucking slavery. That doesn't mean that slavery wasn't a thing, and they had different views of it during that time. But it's a real uh, slippery slope, so I'm not going to go there. It's like pointing the finger at Lovecraft and saying... Uh, could you repeat some of that? Because you were kind of, you were kind of skip, you were kind of... Static yeah, I think you I think you froze. Yeah, I saw you freeze. Um, yeah, I was saying it's it's boring because you're just pointing at Lovecraft saying you're just like most people of your time. Shame on you. It's like how what, what do you what are you trying? I, I don't understand. It's like it's like they expected him to somehow like. I don't know, be uh, stand apart from the crowd because I, I don't know why they would expect that. Maybe because he was a well-read guy. You think he'd be more cultured and and more uh, open minded and stuff like that. But yeah, it's it's like I don't know. It's it's like going back a thousand years and pointing a finger at um, uh, like a slave owner, for instance, and wherever and saying shame on you. It's like, well, that's just well, what hold did on a then. second. It's, hold on a minute. <laughs> It's a bit different when you're owning other human beings. <laughs> no, but what I'm get what I'm getting at is that when it's a norm, and when most people think this way and do these things, you can't go back and judge them and say, "Shame on you! You shouldn't have done that." It's like, well, what? I mean, granted, there were people who weren't racist in, in Lovecraft's time as well, but like, it was a minority. So all you're doing is saying like Lovecraft was of of his time. That's all you're saying when you say he's racist. That's that's really all you're saying. And to me, it's not an interesting conversation. It's not like he was now if he was different. So let's say if in the early 1900s, most people weren't racist and he was very racist. Then I say like, OK, it's 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 worth pointing the finger at that or the inverse. Right. Maybe he lived in a very racist uh, uh, community and he wasn't he was. He was very anti-racist. Mm. Then I'd be like, wow, okay, that's a unique thing. But all you're doing is saying, hey, a guy, that guy had brown hair when everybody had brown hair. That son of a bitch. It's, I, I just don't, I, I don't, I don't understand um, why people think it's an interesting conversation to have or why. I think it's because he's so popular, to be honest with you. I mean that's kind of my well pet yeah theory. yeah but like wh- wh- why why are we judging someone through a modern lens I guess and yeah, blaming yeah. the person back in time I guess that's what I don't understand it's like and again I'm not excusing his behavior and I don't think it's right but also it was just kind of of the time so I, I don't I don't know what there is to be said I mean you know, there's really. also the fact that I I mean one of my gripes with Joshi is he he likes to be very obtuse when some people go hey. This guy was kind of a racist dickhead, and it kind of influenced his work a bit. And he goes, no, cosmic horror, cosmicism. And I'm like, you know, Joshi, you know that's not entirely true. You're, you're right. Yeah, it's pretty, it's you have pretty a point. obvious. You have a yeah. point. And, you are, and he always says in his little snarky responses to people who have issues with Lovecraft's racism, oh, I've written tons about the subject. Okay then why the fuck are you acting so oblivious when someone points out, hey, Lovecraft was racist, and sorry, it did influence his work, rather consciously or not. But again, that's yeah, a course. gripe for another time. But that does bother me. That's kind yeah, of the only I, I, thing about that conversation that bothers me, as well as yeah, the I people who, who kind of virtue signal about it. But, you know, you've kind of gone over that, so I won't... I won't yeah, up, well, I mean, um, like one of his greatest stories, in my opinion, the one that I one of the I like the most is one of the ones I like the most is the Shadow of Rinsmith, right? And that's mm-hmm. very heavily um, influenced by, you know, his view that, you know, changing thing. You know, it's it's more metaphorical, I guess, in that story than literal than something like the horror Red Hook. Even though in the horror Red Hook, it wasn't just minority; it was it was Europeans, it was all these people, kind of like stuffed into these. Yeah, it was basically his um, like angst after getting back from New York. So yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm. So yeah, it totally influenced his his views. But um, I guess yeah, the ones that I find more interesting or interesting are the ones that are more metaphorical. Meaning, if you understand his worldview, you can see how this story arose. 
without it literally being him talking about other races in a in a derogatory way. You know what I mean? Sure. Like like I said, I, I think Shadow Under Under Innsmith, for example, I think that's more of like a subconscious thing. I don't think he I went out of his I don't think it's like the horror yeah. of Red Hook where he's going like, oh right. these oh, these Jews and black people and you know, it wasn't like that. Um To be fair though, to be fair, it wasn't only Jews it was all, oh, all oh, yeah, colors sure. of the rainbow. So I think that's Honestly, like, because I've read the Shadow over or, or the um, the Red Hook story. Recently, I, I just said I just said Jews and black people for for easy reference because <laughs> YouTube's gonna flag you now. Yeah, but I yeah, think sorry. I think in fairness, um, they're gonna meme the shit a, out of that. There was in the a it was a very <laughs> yeah it was a very diverse. It wasn't just about people who aren't white. There were plenty of white people in the horror Red Hook that he was referring to. So it was more about like outsiders coming in, less about overt you know racism based on the color of your skin so yeah Which is no, part it's... of the reason why i felt like victor laval kind of missed the boat and his ballad of black tom as well but anyway yeah i disagree but whatever um now what was i gonna say oh yeah i will say it's not even about the racism in this case it's just it's just plain intellectual dishonesty you're being obtuse when you know damn you know for damn sure that it wasn't just subconscious. Yeah. So don't fucking act oblivious and say, "Oh, it wasn't even that bad compared to the time." You've wrote about him. You've read the papers. Yeah. You've read his personal letters. You know for damn sure it wasn't just of the time. Right. That bothers me. Well, I mean, but aside yeah, from that, and, uh, yeah, that's not Robert what bugs Howard. me about Lovecraft. It's more of the conversations yeah. about it that bug me. So there you go. Yeah, I think I think I think um, pretending it didn't exist is pretty ignorant and short sighted because it definitely did. But also, like I think, I think it as a talking point to judge him is to me it's sort of like a pointless conversation. Yeah, it was like it's that world like, fantasy award thing this? from like a decade ago. It was just I I cringe looking at it now because it's just like. For one, the guy can't defend himself. He's dead. So there you go there. And it's like, you know, I hate the I I, because generally the, you know, it was the standards of their time argument is kind of a slippery slope for me. But you have to take into account, yes, there were different standards back then. They had different opinions back then. Did everyone have those? No. But still, you know. Yeah, but the vast majority of people did. I mean, it was it wasn't uncommon back then, and I think that's my point. It's like, okay, so Lovecraft fit into the majority of of worldviews. Like, what's your, what's your point? I don't understand what your point is. And the funny thing is, is someone who's actually been to the convention that celebrates his life and work. I saw some of the most divert the diver- one of the most diverse crowds I've ever seen. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of that's kind of funny. Yeah, that's kind of funny. You know, yeah. like there's so many I mean, like weird like. I don't want to say freaks, that sounds bad, but like these kind of, you know, people like S.T. Joshi and people like Caitlin Kernan, a transgender woman, or, you know, I've met plenty of like, I I don't, actually not plenty, but I've met people, you know, black people, you know, Victor Laval, there's even Quinn's Ideas who likes um, Lovecraft, and he's a black guy. It's really fascinating how many people are attracted to Lovecraft's work, even though like, because he was writing from the perspective of a, anglophile white nerdy guy from the 1920s right and i think that's that's to me what uh, this conversation is very tired and pointless for me is because i feel like his work has transcended all of that clearly because his fan base is very diverse very broad so i don't know why we're still talking about. i mean hell a drag a dude who dressed in drag a guy named uh (laughs) uh, wh uh pugmire i think was a guy's name i apologize if i got it wrong but you know, he was he was a big Lovecraft nut. Yeah, when I when I was at Necronomicon, I I saw more trans people in one place than I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. So it's like it's like there you go. I mean, clearly, uh, his work for them has has transcended anything that you know, all of these um, detractions. And so I, I get, I feel like it's virtue signaling anymore when people talk about it. Like, you know, like I remember Daniel Green um, made a Lovecraft video or brought up lovecraft or i can't remember what it was but um 
he he had a deadpan shots serious fu- face. Shots fired. <laughs> yeah, he can. I'll yeah, I'll take him anytime. Um, he uh, he looked dead in the camera. We got to stop celebrating this guy. Basically. Oh it's my like, god. Dude, just get over yourself, man. I I just shut up. You know, like um, yeah. I was like, what are you what are you doing? Like nobody's like praising Lovecraft for his racist worldview. They're, 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 they enjoy his work. It's, 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 it's something else now. Yeah. There's even critics I like who've, who've done that, you know, like I've, I, I I don't know. Thomas doesn't watch my channel, but I I love you, Thomas, if you watch this. Um, but SFF 180 has also done this. He's like, oh yeah, he's Uh, probably kind of a dickhead, you know, he loves his work, but you know, he's like, he's probably kind of a dickhead. I'm like, you don't freaking know the guy, you know? That's always what yeah. kind of bugs me about, you know, when stuff like that happens. I'm like, you don't freaking know the guy. You don't know what he was thinking at that time or that moment in that place. Right. But anyway, right. Uh, like I said, I wanted to keep it brief. It's there. It exists. You can go find some other videos that will probably be better than this one talking about it. <laughs> Hell, oh yeah. we could probably do a whole conversation just talking about that subject. Um, because I would, I, I would much rather get into the, um, the, uh, the soul of his, uh, of what he was talking about, which is where I think Joshi has a point where I think he's right is a lot of the people who talk about the racist stuff, um, kind of miss the point on what Lovecraft was actually talking about, which is, you know, the insignificance of people in the face of the cosmos and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where my gripe comes in, because, you know, I just... Uh, now, I'll admit, much of that is just a difference in worldview. Um, but also, it's just kind of, I don't think people would act like that, but... You know, that's just my opinion, but that's kind, that's mainly where my gripe comes in. It's not necessarily like, oh, he was a racist. I mean, yeah, not cool, you know... That does, when you it doesn't, say when you say act like that, what do you mean? Or well, th- th- okay, that's a bit vague wording. Like, like you know, I'm not saying his racism was okay. Is what I'm getting at. No, 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 no. I, you, I, you, you, I think we're beyond that. You were saying how it's it's oh what his, oh about oh the, about oh oh. I mean, I mean, just like there's a one like some a lot of his stories are just people. Figuring out how, oh, how insignificant I am, oh, and then they just fucking, like, crawl up into a hole and die. And I'm like, uh, Mr. Lovecraft, maybe that's what you would do. Um, not everyone is like that. But I think that, that... Even though I think he does that tap into... That 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 enhances I, I do think, that whole thing. I do, I, do, I do think he's tapping into something of humanity, which is, you know... How do we buckle against things we don't understand? You know, there's a vast cosmos out there. Who knows what kind of weird shit is going on over there? I just don't think that having a heroic or, I guess, if we want to take, like, comedy and tragedy, I don't think having a comedy is inherent to Lovecraft. I think it would devalue it, personally. I think the entire... The reason why everybody goes mad or fails or dies to me is sort of or barely makes it out alive. And they also just they just accept it, like Shadow Hunter Innsmouth. He's like, "Oh, I'm part fish person. Okay, let's." Well, what are you gonna do? It's like, that, come I mean, here, like, cousin. Go to the go to the doctor. Like, come I here, I like, come here, expect? cousin. Let's go over there and break out Cthulhu for to take over humanity. I'm like. That does not that it doesn't fucking work like that. At least I don't think it would work like that. Well, to me that to me it's a powerful thing because it just seems to me that you're attracted to certain kinds of stories where it's Maybe. me. It's I'll like, admit, I'll admit. It's, like I said, it, there's a worldview like difference. It's kind of like 1984. Like there's right? a worldview difference there. Do you like the ending of 1984? Oh yeah, yeah. To me, it's it's very much less because it, it, it makes it makes sense for that setting, you know. I, in, sure, in but case. I mean, I, I would argue that all of Lovecraft's endings make sense for his setting too. Possible, it's about and like, like it's, it's like about, I said before. Can't... There's a there's a there's a there's a there there is definitely a a difference in worldview speaking there. I, I you know maybe it speaks to a rosier view of humankind than he had. But I'd be curious what I I think if I read a Lovecraft story where the protagonist 
defeated the ancient the elder ones i'm not or, saying you know, like to defeat the ancient one i'm just saying you know it's like i don't know it's just uh, like i think at least there would be a fight before humanity falls victim to the unknown rah you know i just i don't think i mean we, we yeah, can still they, lose we can still lose yeah. But just the idea that we'll just like crawl into a hole and just like, you know, be like, mm, you know. I guess because it's never a war, right? It's always about one individual or a small group of individuals. It's never like Cthulhu rises up and the and the government's like, all right, get the nukes. You know, it's, it's never, it's, it, <laughs> yeah, it's that would never be a, a story that would be something. like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's never a story like that. And I... I'd be curious, you know, I, I'd be open to it, like to read a story that took that kind of turn with love a lovecraftian story like everything else was very lovecraftian and then somehow it has a somewhat positive or hopeful note at the end i'd be open to read it but to me like i mean it is hard because like that's kind of part of the point of cosmic horror which is yeah exactly yeah you know you're you're you're, you're breaking the genre basically yeah Yeah. no i mean it's it's kind of interesting you know because like laird baron kind of plays with that a little bit um, in his work, I've, again, I've only read his noir novels. I haven't read his, um, I haven't read his collections, which apparently people are like, "Oh my god, this is great!" Ooh, boy, I, I'll tell you right now, I read the Imago sequence, or at least I read sixty percent of it, and I will wholeheartedly disagree. I, I don't, hey, I, I, I haven't I really... read it, so take no, it up I, with I, the I'd critics. Love, no, I'd love to know what people see in Laird Baron because I did not get Lovecraft. I got, I got like an attempt at Lovecraft here and there or but I, I guess I, like true detective is a good example like i all acknowledge not technically cosmic horror though it does kind of fall into that yeah there there's some cosmic horror vibes in it but yeah, there's still like you know it, it kind of has that mccarthy-esque there is evil evil will always exist we can never beat it but what we can do is keep the light going yeah you yeah know? i get that so I, I guess that would be a um which is probably cool the take. nicest ending to a like cosmic horror stories you're gonna get. So <laughs> right, yeah, it, it's it's basically coming to just um um you're you're it's accepting you're accepting that you're never going to win. Let's just keep carrying the light because that matters, you know. And I think that's a profound statement. You yeah, can I mean, I I I find that more story. attractive than oh no, evil squid tentacle things. I'm I'm gonna go cry and. and and angst about it. Yeah. For me, again, there, like I said, there's a worldview difference there, but that's kind of, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you have like, you know, thoughts on that, but that's just kind of how I, I think of it. I just, I don't see it that way. And, and to be no, fair, fair, I mean, I don't know if, if Lovecraft um, had a very rosy view of people. So I, I don't think I would like be like, Lovecraft, you're wrong. And he'd probably be like, too bad, bitch. And then he'd throw like a, th- you know, like throw like a dictionary at me or something. <laughs> <laughs> Which you probably had a lot of. Hold a hold a seance. Oh my god! You're like Lovecraft, what were you thinking? And he's just like, I don't know. I wrote it. Go away. I want to rest now. He didn't mm-hmm. believe in ghosts though. So apparently, yeah, a, an atheist. Atheist, yeah. Unique. Now that was unique for the time. I feel like so. Yeah. No. He, like I. I think he had appreciation for like Christian culture, but he wasn't a Christian though. Yeah. Anyway. Correct. But yeah, that that's kind of the gist of my my issue with with Lovecraft. And also, there's guys like Ambrose Bierce, where I'm like, oh man, this is really good. You know, good stuff. Now, I mean, you you might not feel the same way, um, but you know, I I think is still has that like cosmic horror but there's still like um i don't know how would i put it like the stakes feel more personal i guess i don't know it's mm. it's been some time since i've read some of pierce's um or not pierce beers um this is a good cosmic horror writer he's kind of the early it was an earlier one before um lovecraft showed up uh, yeah i haven't i haven't read a lot of um his influences outside of Poe, so I probably should just to see. 
I, I remember you asked me, like, why do I like Poe so much if I, you know, rag on Lovecraft? I mean, I, I think he had a better grasp on... Well, I think he had a better gr grasp on prose, because, I, like I said, I do think... I mean, I don't think Lovecraft was pretentious, but I do think he kind of overdid it a little bit. Um, I, I think uh, Poe had a better control, and he had a better understanding of how people work than Lovecraft. Because, like, there's a sense in Lovecraft's work he's not really interested in people. Correct. Which, again... I don't think that's a bad thing, but I, that's why I feel like um, Jeff Vandermeer is kind of the modern, you know, in a way he, he modernized Lovecraft and he added characterization and depth and stuff like that. And to where you, you feel it more, but you also feel that same insignificance. Yeah, exactly. Which, I mean, you I know, like I said, yeah. you can do like, I, I think cosmic horror can be done well. I'm not like a, you know, I like sure. depressing shit, but you know. But it's also, just... I mean, the Southern Rich Trilogy is... It's it's a pretty tragic story as well. It's it's not like, um, but it like I don't know. It's it, this is this is just subjective things at this time at, at what I'm saying here. But like I felt it more, you know. Yeah, of course. Like I yeah, I I, I, I understand more why they feel that way. It's not just like oh your cousin was a fish person the whole time. Ooh, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I yeah I think I think you said it best when Lovecraft wasn't interested in it. So that's why I think criticizing and granted we can't have a conversation and find out exactly what his intention is like oh shit i forgot characterization whoops like we don't know that so <laughs> it made a whoopsie we, slips yeah, on a banana to, or something <laughs> yeah we have to assume that like he wasn't trying to do that or he Probably. wasn't interested in that and and that's that's often why i get upset at people uh when they judge writers for something that they didn't intend to do it's mm. like well what do you you're 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 what are you doing? You're, you're that. That's why a lot of times when I review books, I try to think like, okay, I may not know, but I can like what you said. You respect Lovecraft, but you don't necessarily enjoy him that much. Um, I'm I'm like that with like Shirley Jackson, for instance. Like I read The Haunting of Hill House. Well, I like Color Out of Space. Ago. Color Out of Space is a good story. Yeah, but I read the book. I could see what she was doing, and I can appreciate what she was doing. I just didn't find it that compelling like I, I i wasn't that interested in the story itself and that's fair so <laughs> same kind of yeah I, and I think that's what a lot of people should do is not critique people based on things that they didn't intend to do because like what what like why are you doing that like like judge them on, on on what you at least kind of maybe think what they were trying to do but i don't think i think a lot of people they 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 don't view art that way they view art through like just uh like a crude lens where it's like everything must. I think fit a lot of people box. fall into that trap. I mean, I, I fall yeah. into that trap from time to time. I mean, we're talking about Lovecraft yeah. today, and you're like, and you're just like, you don't get it, bro. And I'm like, well, <laughs> well I, I'm just like, I, well, I, I do get it. Do I just don't like that, what that, he's saying. That, that's right, that's right. the truth of it. I just and, don't and like that's it. Fine. Just don't like it. That's fine. I think you I can... appreciate how he does it. I just don't like what he's saying. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's the most important thing is to recognize what somebody is doing or trying to do and at least giving them credit for doing that thing. And then you can you can by all means say that's just not for me. Like I, I don't like that that approach or execution or, or theme or whatever it is, you know. That's totally fine. I, I just think um I uh in uh, you know, reviewing books over the years, it's it's got me to try to be more fair in that regard because Granted, everything we review on our channels is going to be subjective to some degree. Uh huh. But also, I I do give an honest effort to as, try to at least understand what. As my friend what, Philip Chase likes to say, uh, there's not really such a thing as as complete objectivity. Of course not. Of course not. Yeah. Not a, not a, not when it comes to art. Um, but anyway, yeah, that's why I've been trying to do that more lately. Is you know, if I don't like something. Hopefully, I can at least appreciate or understand what they were attempting to do. Um, and then, even if it's not for me, I can, I don't know. But then also, sometimes I read books where I'm like, I don't know what the hell you were doing. Like, it feels like a mess to me. Maybe it's my ignorance. Maybe I don't understand. But um, before I review a book, I, I definitely try to think like, okay, well, what was the intent here? Now, of course, I don't know because I didn't have a conversation with the writer, but... Um, I try to recognize it just to give them at least um, credit for doing something, regardless if I liked it or not. Yeah, I, I think that's a I think that's a good point to make. I mean, it's kind of a I mean, you know, and also if I if I read stuff that agreed with me all the time, it would be pretty boring. 
Now, I mean, well, yeah, you got to read stuff that challenges you. That's why I'm I'm glad you read. You and I, we we don't we're not like a fantasy booktube channel. Like we read no, all kinds I, of stuff. I, and I think it's and like look, I, really I love important. Cormac McCarthy. Now, do I? I am I? Uh, I'm not as pessimistic as he is, but I appreciate what he. Or well, I mean, I, I think that's a whole conversation for another time. But point I'm trying to make here is I don't agree with everything he's saying, but I appreciate how he does it, and I, I really respect how he does it. So there you go. Yeah, you know, it's kind of um. How do I put it? Um, and there's also like a really profound thing that he says in his work that really speaks to me personally. Lovecraft does not do that, even though you know well, I like think the he road, does. Right? Yeah. The road is, is exactly what you talked about. It's it's a very hopeless, bleak, terrible world, but they got to carry the fire. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's um, and and you know that's his most optimistic work, so that should tell you everything you need to know about before Matt McCarthy is. It's an author, but yeah. you know, it's like yeah, you know, we we connect with art differently. Like you you really you really connect with Lovecraft's cosmic indifference. I I quite I find it fascinating, but I just again, I understand what he's doing. I just don't agree with it. <laughs> New Cthulhu. Yeah. New Cthulhu is, is the point of this chat. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> um, uh, you, you don't have to new Cthulhu. But, yeah, it's just, you know, art t- touches you in different ways. Of course. Which I know. That's what's so great about it. Which I know. Shocking revelation there, Britain. Um, shocking, I know. <laughs> But yeah, no. I think that's what's so great about reading. But I I thought here today we could, or tonight anyway, because it's it's evening where I'm at. Like we could sit here and have a conversation with differing points of view, but we could come to an understanding. Is what I was hoping. (laughs) Yeah, I think we have. I I hope so. I hope so. Yeah, I think I I did ramble a lot during this conversation. No, I, I I see your point. I mean, we've had this conversation on the side plenty of times, and. I, I, that's why I don't, you know, how like, you know, how some people get angry when you don't like, when you don't like something. Yeah. Like I try, I try not to be that person as much as possible. Like I, same, I, I get yeah. all these comments. If I don't like a book telling me how stupid I am and how I missed the point. <laughs> and it's like, it's like I insulted their family or their mother or whatever. And it's like, <laughs> just, man, just, just, uh, just say, and that's another reason when I review books, I try to stay away from things like, like when I when I reviewed Victor Laval's book, I didn't talk about racism, racist commentary or anything like that, because I want to judge it for the story that it is, not the politics or mm. worldviews or anything like that, because I knew what he was doing. Um, but regardless of what you're doing, I feel like the story needs to work. And so that's one way you can dance around the haters is um, critique the story for being a story and not like. I don't know, like what the, the intent was in terms of like the message someone was trying to do or uh, say, because um, that to me that should just be that should be like the icing on the cake, not the cake. But anyway, yeah. Lovecraft, uh, I misunderstood. Uh, yes, he was a racist. Um, I think he wrote great fiction. Britain's not so sure. Um, I think he yeah. wrote interesting fiction. Interesting. I just don't personally like go. it. <laughs> yeah. Or well, I don't. And I can, to- I can, I can totally understand that. That's why when people ask me about Lovecraft, like, well, what, what do you recommend? I'm like, oh man, oh, it's so hard for me to recommend. Maybe the color out of story. space. I'm like, try yeah, that. I, I always, yeah, I like the Shadow of Rinsmith too. I think that's a very accessible story. But mm-hmm. um, he, it's hard. Yeah, it's hard to recommend because it's kind of like personal to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like you either get Lovecraft or you don't get Lovecraft, meaning you like his stuff or you don't like it. Um, I don't know that there's much in between. So, yeah, I mean, there's authors that's like that for me, you know, like like Ray Bradbury or Alan Moore. People ask, "Hey, where oh, do you start man. with Alan Moore?" And I'm like, Bradbury is easy for me because uh, I think you he's know. accessible. Well, okay, yeah, yeah Bradbury's easier than than Lovecraft. Bradbury, like, I, I don't know anybody who doesn't like Bradbury. Like, he's sort of the everyman. Or at least respect him. I, I've met a couple of people who are like, eh, but, like, they still respect him. But, okay. yeah, I agree with you, though. I haven't met yeah. anyone who's just gone, like, he's bad. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I'd i be shocked. 
I know. Yeah, I would. I would be shook. I'd be like, what? <laughs> or Charles Dickens. Like, I have a very deep attachment to Charles Dickens's work. Um, it's kind of hard to recommend him, though. I would probably say Oliver Twist because you know a lot of people know it already, and you know it's it's a great story. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. I think I I think that's about it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I think I'm, we A to Z Lovecraft. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I've uh, I, I I think I talked about all I, I I wanted to talk about with Lovecraft. I'm sure I'll I'll have something else I'll think of about Lovecraft in the future, but. As far as thoughts and on his legacy and where he's going and how he's gone, uh, I think I think we've come to an understanding here today. I think so. So, um, Jason, thanks for coming again and hanging out with me and talking about Lovecraft for, for a little bit. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Um, if you want to share where people can find you, feel free. You can uh, find me right here on YouTube, Jason Furman. Look me up. I review books and 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 such, just like Britain here. Oh uh, yes, I am on. I am also on YouTube called Some Oaky Dude, where I cover books, comics, whatever fancies, um, whatever f- uh, fancies me at the moment. Um, you can find me on Twitter, uh, Instagram. Blue Sky. I don't really use Blue Sky, but if you want to check me out on there, feel free. Uh, Goodreads, Letterboxd, like, subscribe. I'm trying to get to 500 right now. So, um, getting before, close. Bef- before the end of the year, like, it's just, it's inching closer and closer. But, um, yeah, I'm glad we managed to get this together. Uh, until next time, this has been fun. <laughs> See you guys.